Hey guys, it's CL, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make brand new Critical Role recaps every Monday at noon, and would be happy to have you join the party. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and hit the Bertrand bell to be notified of future videos. Now, without further ado, let's discuss the 68th episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. Please bear with me, as I might sound a little ill, and that's because I went to Gen Con and caught the con crud, so wish me luck. The episode resumes in the tiny cave where Bell's Helves, Barney, and the rest of the rescued Ashari are resting for the night. We talk to Chetney's new sword, named Gristachar, the Luminary Blade, say that four times fast, who was once a great king and now conveniently has amnesia, so who knows what its true intentions are. JK, we do. Fresh Cut Grass casts legend lore. And a voice comes through the ether saying, The radiance is a curtain. The light is false. The blade corrodes. The metal follows the prince's will. And the party speculate the demon prince, maybe? But anyway, it's bad news. But Sam gives it to Chetney anyway, despite knowing it's bad news, and reassured everyone at the table that they can cast greater restoration if things go too wild. That night, Imogen has a ruinous dream for the first time since she attempted to dream state during the whole Wild Mount escapade. She feels herself lowered to the Red Storm, past valleys and cityscapes. There's homes and buildings, and she sees over a hundred humanoid figures, and they all at once turn to look at her with purple glowing eyes. Not creepy at all. The dream shifts, and she's seeing more of the surface of the Red Moon. There are breaks in the storm, and you can see valleys with movement and she goes to check it out. There's an ecology on the moon. She sees herds of beasts, but suddenly feels a presence behind her. It's her mother, Liliana, telling her to run, as always. She asks her mother why she can't just leave too, and she says that she needs lewdness just as much as he needs her, and that she's going to set her daughter free. Imogen rolls a natural 20 whiz save to what I assume is her mom trying to shove her from the dream, but she rises above the storm and sees a red thread tied to Exandria. The next morning, Imogen shares this with her friends and FCG decides to cast Commune and dares to ask the same risky question that Deanna did, are you worth saving? The god of course says, of course. And when they ask her if she's scared, she shows them erupting mountains behind her, exploding fire everywhere. Yeah, she's scared. Fully rested and terrified, the party teleport back to Zephra, with some of the Hells hanging out in the portable hole to make room for some of the Ashari. They deliver the blue, definitely not perineum flowers, and the voice of the Tempest's helpers quickly make an antidote for the poison, and they successfully heal her. The leader of the Arashari gathers her people to unite them and show that she is recovered, and they celebrate Orem and his friends for having brought the flowers and Barney home earning him a new title, the Savior Blade of the Tempest. How cool is that? Bells, Hells, and Keyleth gather in her quarters once again to discuss everything under the sun. Keyleth lets them know that there's been some temple attacks, and we were one of them, gulp. She also divulges that despite our last seeing him on the moon, Ludinus has recently been seen at the Dwindalian Empire, meeting with King Dwindle. That can't be good. She also says that some of the soldiers they saw from Vasselheim when they were back in Drusar that were heading towards the excavation site have already left, as Vasselheim is currently walling itself in to prevent attacks. It seems parties along the borders aren't exactly happy with the religious city. It survived the Calamity and Vecna. Imagine if the mighty city got taken down now because of this. Orem finally shares with Keyleth the vision that was given to them by the Matron of Ravens. This obviously doesn't bring her comfort. Ashton tells her that Asmodeus is aligned with them, as they recall Fern's new demon boyfriend, and she just warns them to be careful with who they're making deals with, even though the enemy of our enemy is currently our friend. Imogen tells her about the moon and how it has an ecosystem, which shocks the druid, and in order to ask the Rylora questions, Imogen summons her crimson shade and notices it's more present than usual. It's not the semi-translucent figure anymore except maybe the feet. Though the Tempest is on guard, the woods surrounding them beginning to point weapon-like, ready to pounce just in case, Imogen begins her questioning. Its name is the sound of a jingling sapphire stone-centered plant, an image that she pushes into her mind. Which, I don't exactly know how to pronounce that, so I'm gonna avoid saying its name at all costs. 
and its purpose is to serve until her binding is done, whatever that means. We also learn something really sad. Just like Imogen dreams of Ruidus, the Rylora dream of Exandria and see what they dream. There's almost a sad yearning for it. Beautiful canyons and cityscapes and forests and it's very different from where they're from. Imogen asks them about Pradathos and they say that Pradathos is a progenitor, the heart of the world, and it stirs. It leaves twisted life in its wake. And as the monster is unsummoned, Laudna wonders if that means that the Rylorans were once Exandrians, something that we've been toying around on this channel for a while. Ashton asks the Tempest about the Hishari, and she talks about the bastardization of her lineage. She takes their hand and examines them and finds something incredible. They are titan in blood. That whatever the Hishari did came at a great cost, but it did something. Hence the barbarian standing before us. However, she's unsure if the Titan and the Dudamantic part of their being mesh well. We even learn that Yvonne Trevere, the leader of the Hishari, was once a Galdrashari themself before everything that happened, and turned himself into a tree. Keela tells them a place they might seek answers. The tree itself who is now the great tree of atrophy that looks over the cycle of renewal. Located on the island of Kalutha in the Shattered Teeth. Everyone was hype about the Shattered Teeth. Same. For a second, I thought a crackpot theory might be that that tree was the one that Larian destroyed when the city was taken down in Calamity. However, we know it's not. It's, it's a Von Trevere, but still, how cool would that have been? They also show the leader the harness that they recovered, and though she doesn't know how it would help, though she recommends maybe severing the head if Ludinus was to wear it, which love that idea, but it could maybe help if it was fixed. So the party have a couple game plans going on. One, go to the Shattered Teeth. It might hold answers not only to Ashton, but to powers that can help stop Ludinus. Two, to fix the weird harness thing, track down to Vexian. Changebringer wasn't too clear on whether it was D or Dancer that could help fix the harness, but hey, that would be a good step, even if it was Maya or Emahara Joe fixing it, so... And finally, number three, Imogen floated the idea of gathering champions of the gods together for the final fight. I hope they consider that idea because that would be sick. Anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe and tell me what you thought of the episode. Don't forget to check out my recaps of Campaign 3 on my channel. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Bidet, my friends.